All right. Well, thank you, uh, Patrick. And, uh, and again, um, the station is in new hands, and it looks like in, in good hands. Um, Mark, one of our members, is also uh, you know helping uh, out with the, uh, the media as well. All right, moving along, I think Dixon has a few um, oh, wait, words of wisdom or jokes. Uh, George K. McGregor. I want to give you his bio. So, and you have the telephone number on that sheet of paper that's on the table. So you can call him and let him know how disappointed we are. But anyway, George was appointed the Planning and Community Development Director for the Town of Simsbury in April of 2022. So he's only been on the job of six months or so. He has over 27 years experience working for the local governments and private sector development interests in South Carolina, Virginia, and Connecticut. George is a member of the American Institute of Certified Planners, that's AICP. He holds a BA in political science from uh, Fairfield University and is a and as a member in city and regional planning from Clemson University, George resides in Bloomfield, Connecticut with his wife, Susan. Uh, I can't tell you between the activity that Steve and I have tried to, Steve and Dane have tried to get a hold of this guy. I had three questions for him, and uh, I'll just blurt them out to you. Where do we stand on a affordable housing. And the last time there was a report, the, the uh, value for an uh, affordable house was 240000 And what percentage are we to the target of 10% of all of the housing in Simsbury to be affordable? Um, just in the paper a couple of days ago was Glastonbury is not permitting any in law apartments. That was an interesting thing. I, I went to get the paper and my wife had already recycled it. Um, what about the increase in population in Simsbury with all these apartments? And uh, are the schools adequate as far as handling it? They, they were my three questions and I asked them to work it into the program, but he didn't show. Anyway, here's a joke for the day. Uh, here's a text message. Uh, it says, hi, Morris. This is Saul next door. I've been riddled with the guilt for a few months and have been trying to get up the courage to tell you face to face. When you're not around, I've been sharing your wife day and night, probably much more than you. I haven't been getting it at home recently. I know there's no excuse. The temptation was just too great. I can't live with the guilt and I hope you'll accept my sincere apologies and forgive me. Please suggest a fee for usage and I'll pay you. <laughs> Signed, Saul. Morris, feeling enraged and betrayed, grabbed his gun, went next door and shot Saul, dead. He returned home, shot his wife, poured himself a stiff drink and sat down on the sofa. Morris then looked at his phone and discovered a second text message from Saul. It said, hi, Morris. Saul here again. Sorry about the typo on my last text. I assume you figured it out and noticed that it, that, that damn spell check had changed Wi-Fi to wife. Technology hell. A little bit the death of us. <laughs> it was. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> All right. Back to Paul. Okay, back to Paul then. Um, I guess I can use that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm just going to say that. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, this will be an ad hoc overview of the experience that I sh sh shared with a, a small group of other naval officers. For perspective, 60 years ago this month, we were in a crisis. It was called the Cuban Missile Crisis. Now for perspective, I think some of us feel that we may be in a similar situation today with Putin's threat 
of using tactical nuclear weapons. We don't know whether that's going to happen, but we pray that it does not. So with that in mind, let me just start off. And uh, if there are parts of what I'm saying ad hoc, you don't really understand, interrupt me, and I'll do my best to try and clarify. So 60 years ago, <clears throat> I was just got home from uh, the ship, which we were tied up in HMCS Dockyard. I was a junior officer in the Royal Canadian Navy, serving on HMCS Kootenay, which was a destroyer escort ship in the 5th Canadian Escort Squadron, operating out of Halifax, Nova Scotia. So it was a Monday night. <clears throat> I got home. We had watched President Kennedy speak to us, actually speak to a good portion of the world about the crises that we were really in with the Soviet Union. We didn't know what was going to happen next. Uh, my wife and I were particularly concerned in our own personal lives. We had just lost our baby daughter. And it was a difficult time in more ways than one. All of a sudden, the phone rang. Commanding officer, this is Harry Shorten. Paul, I'm sending the Jeep up for you. Be prepared for a long cruise. Pack accordingly. So what the hell is going on? So I got down to the ship, and of course, <clears throat> immediately, we slipped, went over, loaded up with high uh, explosive ammunition, Mark 43 torpedoes and slipped out of Shabukto Head. And on the way out, we ran headlong into about 15 Soviet Elint trawlers. Now, these are electronic, electronic intelligence ships that basically were trying to determine what we were doing. They looked at and took photographs of all our antenna. And of course, they were being escorted by about a 10,000 ton mother ship to which they basically uh, reported. So <clears throat> it was a fascinating entry into what turned out to be a three week harrowing experience. We were part of a NATO anti submarine squadron, and our responsibility, of course, was to work with. NATO navies and ostensibly keep the Soviet submarines out of our hair. Now, at the time, what we had access to was what's called a SOSIS system. Some of you may be familiar with it. Wally, you may be as an ex-submariner. Uh, and what it really was is probably 10,000 miles of underwater cabling in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, where very, very sensitive hydrophones uh, existed on this cabling. And all NATO Navy ships were required to run a particular course after you come out of refit or we re just launched. And your propeller signatures were recorded. Now, if you can imagine, we're talking about the U.S. Navy, the Canadian Navy, the British Navy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But all this information on propeller signatures were being stored in computers in Shelburne, Nova Scotia, and Norfolk, Norfolk Virginia for the West Coast. And really what that meant is that when we put to sea <clears throat> that early Tuesday morning back in November, or October 62, we had a rough idea where the Soviets had positioned their submarines. And in essence, what they had done is basically lined the East Coast with all of their diesel electric boats. At that time, our intelligence indicated that they may have had two or three nuclear boats, but these were, how shall I say, uh, rather speculative in their performance capabilities. 
So we felt, okay, we're dealing with diesel electric submarines. And what are the other characteristics? Now, at the time, those particular Soviet submarines had three intermediate ballistic missiles stored in the sail, i.e. the conning tower. And what they had to do, they had to surface, they had to take a fix as to where are we, in that the missiles were already programmed, pre-programmed with specific targets. So they knew what their targets were, but they couldn't launch unless they actually programmed the missile and said, this is where you're going to be, and of course you know where you have to end up. So the point was, they had to surface, put their sails awash, take a fix, program the missile, and launch. They couldn't launch submerged. They had to launch with their sails awash. And that, in turn, according to our intelligence at the time, would take them about 90 seconds. And that's all. So what was the defensive plan? Obviously, keep the submarines suppressed. Keep the Soviet boats down. If they don't surface, guess what? They can't launch. They can't program the missiles. They can't launch. So with that piece of information, we were directed to a location off Cape Hatteras. And the reason we were positioned there is Cape Hatteras had a number of radar reflectors which meant that the Soviet subs could readily surface and take very, very rapid fixes off these uh, reflectors, program the missiles, and launch. So our, our, pro, our SR objective was keep anything subsurface. Okay, well, it sounded pretty straightforward. Now, <clears throat> there were only three junior officers. I was one of them on this uh, particular destroyer. And the rest of the officers had responsibilities, weapons officer, engineer officer, submarine uh, weapons, etc., etc. So three of us basically drove the destroyer for a period of three harrowing weeks. And it was harrowing. The seas were rough. Uh, we were novices. And of course, we didn't really have a complete picture of what was going on. Now I remember, and this looks to me in retrospect over the years like a Hollywood movie. I came up <clears throat> onto the bridge and it was about <coughs> five to eight <clears throat> in the morning. And of course we were pinging away with active sonar. So imagine, you know, this is what you're hearing, okay? All of a sudden, I'm in the midst of transit, the transiting to me as the new officer of the watch. What that means? We thought we were running over a submarine. All the indications were that that's basically what had transpired. And so consequently, for the next four hours, while I was basically on duty, we ended up working with two fixed-wing aircraft, a U.S. Naval Neptune and a Royal Canadian Air Force Argus. And these guys, basically in, con in concert with us, we were directing them from the operations room. And of course, I was basically running this bloody destroyer on the bridge. A harrowing experience, just to say the least. Have you ever experienced, even heard of, a ship plane collision? Well, we came within probably 75 or 80 feet like that, I recall. All of a sudden looking up in this U.S. Naval Neptune, it was down on the water, about 25 feet off the water going about 180 knots. And we were in the process of doing a 180 degree turn. And all of a sudden, the entire bridge filled up with aircraft. <laughs> and just the guy, I remember the pilot's eyes, they were like this. 
I think mine were too, and I thought they were going to take off our radar antenna, but they missed us. So <clears throat> that was a hair-raising event. We eventually lost, we think, that probable submarine in rough weather at some time after I left the watch. It must have been about 1300 in the afternoon. Now, let me step out of <clears throat> where I was and now try and say, what was the real situation at that particular instant in time? We <clears throat> thought, we, well, I guess we, I can say better than that, we knew that the Soviets had positioned missile launching facilities in Cuba. They had intermediate ballistic missiles. We know that for a fact. Uh, we had, they had launching pads. And what we didn't know is that there were three nuclear warheads in Cuba at the time. We didn't know this, and I think that I can speak for the US public, the Canadian public, we didn't know either. <clears throat> now, moreover, <clears throat> there was a flotilla of three Soviet diesel electric submarines stationed in the Saragasso Sea, which is basically between Cuba and the tip of Florida. And there was a squadron commander, and of course, each of the subs had its own captain. On the senior submarine, unbeknownst to us, they had a nuclear rocket. We did not know this. Moreover, these submarines were designed for northern waters. And here they were basically being suppressed by the US Navy. The Navy knew they were there and they had their ships basically on top, keeping these guys suppressed. As I understand it, the seawater temperature was around 80 degrees. Wally, you can imagine what it would be like in a submarine there for maybe two and a half weeks, where in effect, you're not air conditioned, under unbelievable pressure because the US Navy is beating on you and pinging on you and so forth. The frustration must have been extreme. In any event, the captain of the lead ship in the flotilla, having been absolutely frustrated over a period of about two weeks, made a decision. He's going to launch a nuclear weapon at the US fleet above him. Really what happened, the squadron commander overruled him. And we came within that basically hair, hair's breadth of a nuclear Armageddon. We never knew this. This subsequently surfaced about 40 years ago because the squadron commander, the Russian squadron commander became the captain of one of the first, how shall I word this, a, a ballistic missile submarines for the Soviet Union. And this surfaced only because they had a loss of coolant accident. That means they had a reactor pressure vessel <clears throat> rupture at sea. Basically, a large number of the <coughs> crew were irradiated Several died, including this particular now captain of this nuclear boat. And on his deathbed, this is what he had to say about the Cuban missile situation. So in closing, I think the history that we had 60 years ago this month is facing us today. And all I can say is, we pray that Putin has common sense 
And those around him have a major influence on preventing any tactical, tactical nuclear weapon launch. So that's it, gentlemen. Thank you. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.